work out a new deal come January. I'm joined now by Doug Holt Eakin, who is former chief economist for President George W. Bush, now president of the American Action Forum. Also, Jared Bernstein, MSNBC contributor and former chief economist to Vice President Biden. Good to see both of you gentlemen. Good morning. Nice to see you. All right, so, Doug, obviously the case for waiting until January is that a new Congress should be able to work out a deal sometime in 2013 in a less partisan atmosphere uh, and announce essentially that the tax cuts would be retroactive uh, to January 1st. Do you think that has some merit? Uh, I think we should stipulate at the outset that um, the economy is very weak and actually going forward with the, the tax increases is a recipe for a recession that the Congressional Budget Office has said as, as much. So the real question then is, you know, is there a way to get a deal? And uh, this idea of somehow letting everything sunset and then doing it retroactively, I think was first floated by OMB director, former OMB director Peter Orzag. And I think that's appropriate because this is the ultimate budget gimmick. And uh, in the end, if you, if you pretend that you're going to keep taxes low, let them raise and bring them back down, uh, you're playing a game that the American public's not going to appreciate. And so I think that's a dangerous way to go. And it's especially dangerous from an economic point of view, because I don't think markets will buy this gimmick and you'll run the risk of, of real economic distress late this year. So it would be better simply to extend them all, as President Clinton said, and, and move on. Is it a risky move, do you think, Jared? I mean, how many voters are going to actually believe, uh, you know, the members of Congress if they say, uh, listen, I think what we're going to do is we're going to hold off. We're going to, your taxes are going to go up, but trust us. It's okay because we're going to pass this deal a little bit later and all this yeah. is going to be retroactive. Well, when you put it that way, Chris, it sounds awfully suspicious. <laughs> I, think you, I think you and Doug make a, a, a lot of very solid points. Uh, the economy is uh, wobbly enough already. We've just gotten some mixed indicators this morning uh, looking forward. But here's the thing. The only thing worse than going over the fiscal cliff would be kicking the can down the road once again. I think that's tremendously uh, fiscally irresponsible. And the idea of extending all of the tax uh, increases and, and, and the spending cuts, uh, once again, I don't think people or markets are going to believe Congress when they say, oh yeah, we'll get back to that. I think the important thing to, to uh, realize here is that it's less of a cliff than a slope. Uh, Doug is absolutely right about CBO's projection, but that's if we go over and stay over. If we can get a great deal before a good deal, a deal that includes new revenues before this expires, we absolutely should. Should. But if we can't, uh, we shouldn't just kick everything down the well, road. What do you think would happen? How would the markets react to that? Uh, everyone I know, certainly who is uh, in my age group, watches their 401k pretty carefully. What would the markets do with that? I think this is a very dangerous moment because uh, if you're an equity market investor, you're looking at the proposition that the dividend tax rate could go from 15% to 45%. And that tripling of, of dividend taxes is going to have big equity market implications beginning this fall, far before the, the supposed fiscal cliff is hit. So, you know, the CBO pointed out the slowdown would begin before January 1st. I think the market implications will be even stronger before January 1st. Uh, I think, you know, it's hard to convince market participants, as you said said that uh, really we're going to raise taxes, but honestly, we don't mean it. There'll be a deal at the other side in an environment when there is apparently no deal to be struck between Republicans and Democrats. So uh, it seems well, to I me guess, that, Jared, we're that really, is the question. Really, what are really the chances <laughs> of a deal before the deadline, realistically? Well, I think the chances of a deal before the deadline are actually fairly low. And I don't think anything any of us can say are going to change that because <laughs> the, the, the president and the Democrats, to their credit, are holding firm on this idea that any deal must include new revenues and you got to bunch of Tea Party conservatives who are pledged to Grover Norquist never to accept that. And so in, in a way, we may very well be looking at going, going over the cliff. The important thing is that the grown-ups in the room start talking about now about crafting a deal that's balanced, that includes some new revenues as well as spending cuts. I think Doug would agree that that kind of compromise is essential. Yeah, well, we're out of time, I, but Doug, i got to ask you really quickly, who are the grown-ups in the room? Who could make this happen? Happen. I think we had we saw a great uh, formulation from former Senator Pete Domenici and, and former uh, OMB uh, Deputy Director Ellis Ribbon, which said, "Yeah, extend the current tax code, but have it be tied to a commitment to doing tax reform next year, which could include all the elements Jared's so interested in." So that's the kind of deal we need now. Don't harm the economy, and then fix the tax code. Doug Holtaken and Jared Bernstein, thank you so much. Uh, happy Fourth coming up anyway, and it looks like Mexico now has a new president.